live stream. Uh, so we're glad to have you all too, but uh, for the small number of people that we have here in the room, I hope that we can still have a good discussion and uh, make it worthwhile for everybody. We're on lesson 86, uh, and we're going to be covering John chapter 6, beginning in verse 22, and going through the end of the chapter. This ties nicely in, I suppose I shouldn't say it ties nicely into the theme that I've chosen for this year, the bread of life. It's where that theme came from in the first place. So uh, it's a nice coincidence that we're, we're starting that theme right about the time that we study this passage, and I'm looking forward to going through it with you all. But before we begin, Logan is going to lead us in a prayer. Let's pray. Our most holy Father in heaven, we come to you now. We're so grateful for the opportunity to to meet together, to bring our minds together, to focus our, our hearts on, on studying your word and learning more about you and your will for us. We pray that you'd be with us, help us to have a productive study. Uh, we pray that you would help us to glean from the your word the lessons that would be applicable to our lives and help us to, and, and we pray that you grant us with opportunities to teach others. We pray that you'd help us to keep focused during this this hour and this, these things we ask through Christ's name. Amen. So, first things first, who would like to recite our current memory verse? Or I should say our brand new memory verse. <laughs> It's from uh, uh, the, the reading in tonight's lesson in John chapter 6, to verse 35. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Okay, so with that, can I get a recap from somebody of last of our Sunday class? Tim? Uh, we had uh, talked about the feeding of the five thousand. That, uh, that the um, <clears throat> the miracle that uh, you know there were only a small number of fish and and loaves, and yet uh, five thousand men uh, were were able to eat and had twelve baskets left over. So uh, the miracle that uh, Jesus performed. Uh, there, we're going to see some of that, you know, carry over uh, <laughs> yeah. in today's lesson. Uh, it's more pertinent than usual to, uh, right. to uh, what happens, you know, as we right. move on. And, and then also we have the the, um, the men going across the water in the boat, and uh, the waters were turbulent, and they saw Jesus on the water, thought he was a ghost, and uh, Jesus said, no, it's, uh, it's, it's me, and Peter, Peter tried to come to Jesus when Jesus said come and he started walking but then started faltering when his faith wavered and so that was a good uh, example of the faith that we should have uh, keep our eyes on Jesus and not lose focus on it. I was trying to remember which kid it was who on Sunday afternoon phrased it that way. He took his eyes off of Jesus and I was thinking that kid has got it and whoever was teaching it to that class or his parents, one of one or the other, maybe both, did a really good job of distilling that. He took his eyes off Jesus. That's why he uh, started to falter in his faith. Okay, so let's get now into the bread of life, lesson 86. Uh, I think that I had Sammy read toward the end of last time, so we'll move up here. And Tim, can you uh, start us off with verses 22 through 24 of John 6? The next day the crowd that stood on the other side of the sea saw that there was no one, no other small boat there except one, and that Jesus had not entered with his disciples into the boat, but that his disciples had gone away alone. There came other small boats from Tiberias near to the place where they ate the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the small boats and came to Capernaum seeking Jesus. All right, thank you. So where had, or rather what, had the crowds assumed about Jesus' whereabouts? Well, they couldn't find him. <laughs> okay, they couldn't find him, but they had seen 
a couple of important things that, you know, some, some evidence that they could go on. There was one boat there. Okay. <laughs> so they know that he wasn't on the boat. They're not exactly sure what's going on. They kind of assume that he's got to still be in this vicinity, but they're looking. He's not there. So their next guess is uh, number one, where did the small boats from Tiberias take the multitude to search for Jesus? Capernaum. To Capernaum, thank you. So where is Tiberias in relation to Capernaum? South, it's on the, it's on the west side of the Sea of Galilee and further south down around the bend there. Okay. That's right, and there's a couple of maps where we can find this. Uh, I think the, the better of the two that's close by is in Lesson 82. <coughs> Excuse me. So, find it. There we go. So, uh, you can see Tiberias is, is kind of midway as far as the north-south of the Sea of Galilee and over on, obviously, as, as Tim said, on the West Bank. Uh, whereas Capernaum is way up on the, the north. It's not exactly the northwest corner because there's no corner there, but it's, you know, the northwest quadrant, I guess, of the Sea of Galilee. So that's, um, I mean, it's not a huge distance. If you were walking it, it would be, you know, between five and ten miles, probably seven to ten miles walking. It's, it's, it's a bit of a hike when all you've got is your feet or a boat. That's a pretty significant distance. It's not like it's right next door. Um, so these boats have, as, as Tim read for us, the boats came from Tiberias near the place where they had eaten the bread, which was on the other side of the Sea of Galilee from, uh, from Capernaum. Now, that doesn't mean like directly across. In fact, that same map, which I just left behind for some reason, the same map in Lesson 82 shows at least the, the, the sort of traditional location of the feeding of the 5,000 uh, just across the, the, the lake from Capernaum toward the north on the north the northeast quadrant, I guess you could say. So they've come from Tiberias to pick up all these people for whatever reason. Somehow they knew that these people were going to need transport, and they come all the way from Tiberias in order to ferry them to Capernaum. Do you think that this service was offered for free? Are you talking about the boat service? Yeah. I mean, boats are coming from this town in order to help ferry the people across the sea. Are they are they just doing this out of the goodness of their own hearts? Logan says no. Why not? It just seems like sea taxiing or travel. You know, yeah, that's probably it's, it's basically yeah. a taxi service. Okay, so they're they're doing this presumably for a fee. They're doing it because they're going to get something out of it. Okay. So that in turn tells us that the people who are who are taking them up on that service are willing and able to pay probably a pretty small amount of money in order to get across the across the Sea of Galilee. So what are they in, in abstract terms, what are they willing to do in order to find Jesus? Pay money. <laughs> they're, yeah, they're willing to part with some of their money for it. Okay. And that's that's good, right? They're they, they realize there's sort of a cost-benefit analysis here, and they're willing to incur some cost. They're willing to take some kind of personal loss, even just for the chance of finding Jesus. Why did they look in Capernaum specifically? That's where his home base was. I mean, pretty much. Yeah. So if you're going to go looking for somebody, chances are you, eventually he's going to come back here. Right. So they're, they're on the other side. They're looking around. They're going, we saw his disciples leave. He wasn't with them. We only have the one boat. I don't know where he is. We looked. We can't find him here. There's the, the taxis. They're willing to take us. Take us to his home. <laughs> take us to his home. We'll pay you to take us to his home in Capernaum, and maybe we will find him there. Okay, let's keep reading. Denise, can you take verses 25 through 29, please? And when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, where did you go? When did you go there? Jesus answered them and, them and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man shall give to you, 
for on him the Father, even God, has set his seal. That they said therefore to him, What shall we do, that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him who he, whom he has sent. Thank you. So question number two, why were the multitudes seeking Jesus? There's some food involved. Right? He gave them free food. Okay. Did they have no other source of food? Well, obviously they, they did. Why? Right? Because they, previously they had mentioned, why don't we just send them, right. send them out to the restaurants and inns and whatever around them, <clears throat> let them eat, you know, themselves. Right. So there must be some. Uh, so there's food around. Yeah. What problems might there be for them in, in acquiring that food, though? Matter? Cost and effort. Cost and effort. Yeah, that is pretty much a very good uh, uh, boiling down of it. There's a cost involved and there's effort involved. These people, by and large, are very poor. It's difficult. And, and, and the food, you know, we take for granted um, up until the last several months that food is going to be, comparatively speaking, dirt cheap. From all of human history, food has been much, much, much more difficult to come by than it has been for us. Um, certainly for my lifetime and for quite a while before that, going back to basically, I mean, World War II, ever since then, it's been pretty cheap to at least get enough calories to live. Denise? Well, and it's, their system wasn't like us where they could go to drive through right. McDonald's and right. get prepared food. Everything, a lot of times their meals were from the butcher on so it wasn't just a really fast meal so they yeah had so to, as they tim had to mentioned plan. they had to plan exactly things and as tim mentioned you could uh you know the the, the, the disciples were, were suggesting that jesus send the uh, the crowds away to go into the towns and find some food and he said you know like there are inns around and yeah that was not exactly like a restaurant but but that's available there the inn expects to provide food for people that's one of the ways that they make money not just by renting out uh, by renting out rooms for the night but also by providing a meal for people who are traveling and they need a meal before they get back on the road so there's there's something like that available but it's going to be expensive if you want a less expensive alternative then as denise said you're going to have to plan ahead of time you're going to have to work really hard so there's Again, sort of a cost-benefit analysis that goes into all of these decisions, and it's a pretty hefty cost to pay, Tim. Well, and the fact that they ate and were filled. Yes. Well, because you, you can eat a lot of times and, and not be filled. It's just like you just got enough. They ate so much that there were scraps left over that nobody wanted. Right. Baskets full of them. Okay, so uh, they, didn't have to, they didn't have to work. They didn't have to, excuse me, to lay down their hard-earned money in order to get this food. That all seems pretty appealing to them. But if there are these other sources of food, here they are, they're parting with their money, as we've just established, in order to get across the lake, in order to find this guy who's going to provide them food. They're willing to part with their money. They're willing to spend their time searching for Jesus and then going to Capernaum just on the, on the chance, the likelihood that that's where they'll find him. They're clearly okay with spending some time on it. They're okay with spending some money on it. Why aren't they putting that toward feeding themselves? Uh, it reminds me that my mom would say, you know, like lazy people will actually spend more effort to avoid doing the thing that they need to do. So they were spending more time to avoid doing the thing that they needed to do. That's, uh, yeah, that, that's, again, hitting the nail on the head. And it's a more um, charitable, I guess, version of my comparison here. This reminds me of, uh, this reminds me of rednecks who keep buying lottery tickets. They're spending tons of their hard-earned money on this ridiculous notion that one day they, they might hit it big, or, or even that they're going to get the little the small wins here and there, and it's going to be worth it for him, for them. Now, they've got to know that the, the, it's just a giant it's just a giant pyramid scheme. I mean, they have to know that every that's it doesn't even it doesn't even hide itself. It just says, "Hey, this is a giant pyramid scheme, doesn't it?" That's that's how a lottery is presented. And yet there are people who will do that deliberately, constantly, waste their time, waste their effort, waste their money on that 
because they're hoping to get something for free, for easy. And it ends up being harder, it ends up not working out, it ends up being more expensive. And that's because they have this incredibly fleshly outlook, and that's exactly what these people are doing. They're not looking for Jesus for the spiritual food that he's trying to offer. They're trying to hit Easy Street. They appreciated that, as Tim pointed out, they ate and were filled. And they didn't have to put that in, as Denise pointed out, all of the time and the planning that was normally involved in making themselves their own meals and, and baking their own bread and preparing that and going through the long process of uh, making the leaven and getting it to rise and going through the second rise, the third rise maybe, and, and baking the thing and keeping your fuel going and having your oven work and getting out the ashes. And all these things that are a constant labor for us. And they figure, well, if I can just skip that and hang out with this guy, he's going to give me food whenever I want. So let's find him. Well, I don't know if we get to the thought question, but you know, one of those has to do with what do a lot of people look to get out of religion yeah. today. And, and there's a lot of that, that social aspect of it mm -hmm. as well. It's like well, the crowd doing this. Everybody's doing this. It's kind of the, it's kind of the thing to do right now. Everybody wants to see, see the miracles. He's, and he said you saw the miracle, but you didn't come to because of that. You came because of the food. Almost like dinner in a movie, you know. <laughs> All right, so they've, they've, they've got the wrong attitude, and he, he's clearly not happy with them. Let's keep reading. McKenna, you want to take verses 30 through 34, please? Therefore they said to him, What sign will you perform, men, that we may see it and believe you? What work will you do? Our fathers ate the manna in the desert, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. Thank you. Didn't these people just see an incredible sign? These are the same people. Jesus just said, you, you're, you're following me because you ate your fill of the loaves. They saw that sign. And now they're telling Jesus, or they're asking Jesus, what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? Isn't that kind of crazy? Logan? Well, it's almost like the, the signs and things are, are compared to the, you know, the bread that's unfulfilling. So, like, it doesn't matter how many miracles. They're just going to want to see more, be more entertained, be more, you know, if, if they're looking for that earthly, you know, purpose, that, that they'll never be fulfilled with that. Exactly. So they're, they're never going to be satisfied in a lasting sense by that physical food. And, and they're not being all that, uh, uh, all, that, all that tactful, I guess, about hinting. What sign do you perform? You know, I mean, if you're looking for suggestions, Jesus, I mean, Moses provided bread for our fathers in the wilderness. So, you know, you could do that if you wanted. They're, they're hinting in this really uh, transparent way that they would like for him to do the same thing again. Right after he gets on them for following him because they ate their fill of the loaves uh, rather than actually seeing the signs. So that, that's all they care about. They're missing the point. They just care about getting some more food. Number three, what does the bread of God give the world? Eternal life. Life. Okay. I thought I had a follow-up question to that. Let's move on. I think we're going we're gonna to be on that topic for a while. So, Logan, can you read verses 35 through 40? And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will, or excuse me, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. For I have come down from my heaven not to, my, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that all he has given me, I, shall, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up on the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Thank you. What is Jesus' ultimate goal? as described in these verses. Dan? Do the will of the Father. 
Yes, and that will is. Logan? Uh, to provide salvation for his people. Okay, so you're, yeah, you're, you're giving an excellent answer, but in different terms than what Jesus used, right? So what is, how does he phrase that? Of what does that, how, what does that salvation look like? Okay. Well, everlasting life, raising them up, raising the raising day. them up on the last day, right? So he says that's that's the Father's will, um, that you know, et cetera, et cetera. I will raise him up on the last day. He used that a couple of times, um, verse thirty nine as well. But raise it up on the last day. So resurrection, that that final eternal salvation, that eternal life, that is the Father's will. That is uh, Jesus's ultimate goal. That's much more important, isn't it? than just saving off starvation for another day. That's what these people are worried about. They're worried about not just, not just uh, you can say, we, we use the term like to save somebody's life, right? Um, and and some, of, some of you are in, in healthcare settings and on a fairly regular basis, you could say, I saved this person's life. And that's fine, that's accurate. But what you've done is to preserve that person's life until they die at a later date. Because they're going to. And everybody knows it. We don't have the ability to provide a lasting salvation. That's what Jesus cares about. Yeah, he, he, you could say that he saved their lives. Maybe there were people who were just about to starve to death in that crowd. And he provided them with, with bread. He saved their lives in a sense, in a physical sense. But that's not really what he came to do. He came to save our lives eternally. He came to, to not, to, not just to preserve us for a little while longer, but to give us a secure life where we don't have to worry about something taking it away from us. Yeah, yeah we're, we're just like them, though, a lot of times. I mean, you, yeah. Right? But the here and now, I'm living today. Yeah. Right? So what about today? I understand eternity's out there, but how do I get past today? And it's, it's really difficult for us, isn't it? Look, it, there's an interesting parallel too. I think another another lesson we can learn in 20, verse 28, where it says, "What what shall we do that um, that we may work the yes. works of God?" They're interested in the works. They're interested in the pro the product. Um, you know, the product of of God's power is these miraculous things, and they're they're interested in all those. But they haven't looked to the source yet. And I think even today we can do the same thing, and we try to you know do you know focus on the works instead of where that source is instead of our faith instead of building our beliefs and we're, we're more concerned about the things we're doing what you know brothers and sisters are doing and play the compare game and then that's when he said and he says this is the work of god that you believe him who sent him and so that and that's what it all comes back to you can't separate the two can right you? if you if there's if there's belief then that is the work if you're doing the works, then that demonstrates the belief. They're so tightly intertwined. One is the other. Dan? It's just worth noting as we, you know, we're progressing in the ministry here. He's getting a lot bolder in what he's saying and proclaiming. Right? He's not just talking about you know, the bread of God. He's here very specifically saying, I am the bread of life. Right? And he, you know, everybody who comes after me will no longer thirst. Right? One point here, he very specifically says, where I have come down from heaven, verse 38, right? very clearly setting himself apart from prophets and any, any other comparisons they can make. That's right. He gets especially, I mean, you can see this in all the Gospels, but especially in John's, he gets more and more, uh, I guess you could say, audacious over the course of the story where uh, he, he's willing to go just a little bit farther and a little bit farther and to push these people and to challenge them a little bit farther and a little bit farther in their beliefs and their understanding of who he is. We'll actually see, uh, kind of jumping ahead of us, but since Dan brought it up, I'll blame it on him. In verse 62, later on, he's talking just to the disciples. Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? He's talking about himself, but he's doing it in the third person. So it's like there we kind of see the limit. He's not quite willing to say, what if you saw me ascending to where I was before? You know, he's, he's opened that door, but he's still... Kind of like it's, he's right on that edge. He's right on that edge of, of how far he's willing to go in the, the claims that he's going to make publicly. All right. Let's keep going here. Uh, Scott, we're up to you. Can you read verses 41 through 51, please? At this, the Jews there began to grumble about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now, now say, I came down from heaven? 
Stop grumbling among yourselves, Jesus answered. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them, and I will raise them up in the, at the last day. <clears throat> it is written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has an ear, the Father has heard the Father and learned from him comes to me. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. <clears throat> Only he has seen the Father. Very truly I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. <clears throat> Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which among which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whosoever eats this bread will live forever. The bread <clears throat> is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. Thank you. Number four, what did Jesus say that caused the Jews to grumble? Okay, and why did this irritate them? They his parents. Sorry? They his parents. Yeah, so we're like, come on, Jesus, we know where you came from. Uh, and so they think it's pretty pretty absurd for him to say that he came from this other source. And then, look, we know you came from your mama. We know your, they think, your dad. So who are you to say that you came down from heaven? That's just ridiculous. Where had Jesus recently encountered the same attitude? Oh, he was in Nazareth. But... Yeah, just a little bit before this was when he was at Nazareth and they said the same thing to him. Isn't this the carpenter? Like, you know, Joseph and Mary's boy, right? Him? <laughs> uh, okay, yeah. How's that working for you? All right, now, Jesus seems to change subjects pretty drastically in verse 44. Okay, so the, the grumbling, I'm the bread that came down from heaven, and then suddenly, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Uh, okay, uh, what's his point going forward from there? Tim? Well, they helped in, in 45 is that this is written by the prophets, they shall not they shall all be taught of God. In other words, everyone is going to have the word of God mm -hmm. accessible to them. And then that word is what draws draws them. So I mean it's not some miraculous feeling that somebody's gonna get her, God's soon gonna be a respecter of persons. It's that God draws them in through through his word and I'll raise him up on the last day is that you know, because I we'll look at my comments in my Bible, oh my God. it's like, yeah, right, I need to scratch that out. Because they're, you know, common. Uh, you know, what the world thinks is that God, you know, God has to call you, basically, mm -hmm. to get you to, you know, come to the, come to, to the Lord. And I, that's not the case. And it seems to me, at least, that what, uh, what Jesus is referring to here in this prophecy from Isaiah is that he's talking about the prophecies that they recognize as as pertaining to the, the coming messianic age, right? So in the kingdom of heaven, you could say, not that Isaiah said it exactly that way, but that's the idea. In the kingdom of heaven, they will all be taught by God. His point is, you guys clearly aren't. Dan. To, to add to that, right, he has again said, and he's not referring to God, he's, he says the Father, right? This is not... <coughs> completely new, but again, this is a new concept for them overall, right? So again, I kind of draw back to, they were just questioning, you like, oh, we know your parents, and here he's talking about the Father, right? And again, referencing, he's got, you know, there, there's a higher calling for him than just his earthly presence. Yeah, so uh, once again, they're looking at things in a very physical sense. They're looking at what they assume to be his physical parentage, and they're sort of half right, I guess. And he's looking at things in an entirely spiritual sense. And because they're not part of it, because they're, they're not in the, um, they haven't accepted, as, as Tim said, they haven't accepted the words that God has given them. So they're not a part of the club. They're not a part of that kingdom. So they're not listening. They're not getting that teaching from God. That's why they don't believe. That's why they don't accept 
that he is the bread that came down from heaven. That's why they're grumbling. So in a roundabout way, it's as if he's saying, well, there's nothing I can do about that, guys. If you don't like it, well, that, that pretty much just demonstrates who you are and that you're not going to be receptive to this message. What is his point uh, about the manna? He's not the first one to bring this up. Well, why does he mention it? What is he trying to get to here? Mallory? The manna served a purpose. They thought they were going to die in the wilderness, mm -hmm. and it came from heaven. So it's to illustrate that you guys are going to die unless you have this eternal life, which also comes from heaven. Okay, so it's obviously not that the manna killed them, right? The manna, in fact, as we were discussing earlier, preserved their lives. They thought, as Mallory said, they were going to die in the wilderness. And they would have if God hadn't provided for them. So he saved their lives. He, he preserved them. He fed them. He gave them what they needed. And in a manner of speaking, you could say that the manna was life to them. Because without it, they were going to die. And yet Jesus is saying, yeah, but they still died, didn't they? Not that day. But eventually they die. Now, I'm the bread. Uh, what verse am I in here? Da, 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 da. Verse 49. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. As if, if you eat this bread, well, you don't have to keep eating it. It is not going to have to be provided for you every morning except for the Sabbath, in which case you better have prepared on Friday. You eat of this bread and that's all you have to worry about. You're not going to die. He's saying that he can provide uh, an enduring and transcendent life that isn't predicated on the continuation of, uh, of, of the, the, the ingestion of food. Okay, let's keep going. Dustin, can you read verses 52 through, I think that says 59? The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks on my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whosoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Jesus said these things in the synagogue as he taught them at Capernaum. Thank you. Number five. What did Jesus say would be the consequence of not eating his flesh and drinking his blood? You have no life in you. Okay, now these people can see, obviously, well, we're still alive, and I mean, here we are rejecting you, and we're still alive, but again, that's not what Jesus is talking about. He's not saying that uh, I'm going to kill you if you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood. He's saying that eternal life, that enduring life, is not going to be accessible to you unless you're willing to eat my flesh and drink my blood. Now, why would this be somewhat disturbing to hear? Eat my flesh and drink my blood. <laughs> okay, hands popped up quickly there. Uh, I think Dan was first, maybe? I mean, there, obviously there's several levels to this, right? He's saying you need to eat his flesh and drink it. He's right there. How am I going to have life in you if I have to consume you? So there's, there's an obvious issue with that. And I guess, you know, uh, maybe for the modern audience, we, we blow past the fact that, like, you know, the blood in particular, right, was unclean. Here he's saying, you need to drink it, not just drink any blood, like my blood, human blood, you know, and, and, it, and it puts all the emphasis on it, right? I mean, that had to just be like tremendously jarring to them on many, many levels, I mean, even beyond the pragmatic aspect of it. That's right, and uh, you know, it's it's odd to think about, um, but I can't I can't recall an instance where the law of Moses specifically says, don't eat other people. It's just one of those things that kind of goes without saying. But, you know, Dan brought up that especially blood is specifically unclean. By the, the dietary code, so is, weird, weird as it is to think about it, so is human flesh. 
right? We're, we're not, uh, we, we, don't, we don't chew the cud, we don't have a cloven hoof, <laughs> so that makes us unclean. We're predators. The predators generally are not clean, or they're not fit for human consumption, even though, as I said, I don't think that that was something that God had to mention, because nobody, not, the Jews didn't want to do that, nobody around them wanted to do that at the time. The, the idea of cannibalism was pretty repulsive to just about everybody in that area, and the blood especially you think about the covenant that God made with Noah. There were not very many things that God included in that. He gave himself a responsibility. He said, I'm not going to destroy the earth with a flood again because you guys are just, every thought of your heart is evil from your youth. And I'm, I'm going to get used to that. And there's going to come a time when judgment, uh, when there's a final judgment, but I'm not going to destroy the, the world in the way that I have done this time. But there's basically like a, a couple of requirements that he makes of Noah and his descendants at that time. One of them is uh, respect life in the sense of if, if somebody or some an animal kills a human, then hold them accountable. The other one is don't eat blood. From from the time of Noah, that was very clear. He said you can eat animals now. As if that wasn't, uh, no pun intended, wasn't kosher before. But now he says you can, just don't eat the blood. And then in, and it's worth looking at this passage in Leviticus chapter 10, uh, I'm sorry, Leviticus chapter 17. <clears throat> Leviticus 17 and beginning in verse 10. If anyone of the house of Israel or the strangers who sojourn among them eats any blood, I will set my face against that person who eats blood and will cut him off from among his people. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. So, even if it wasn't obvious, which it kind of should have been, God makes it very clear to them in the law of Moses that blood is extremely important. Blood is important not only in, in the dietary code, but in the worship, in, in their ritual. The blood is where the atonement comes from because you're substituting this life for your own. And you're not supposed to ingest blood. You're not supposed to do that. He makes that very clear. And now Jesus is saying, you have to drink my blood. You have to, in a manner of speaking, take my life into you, which is explicitly prohibited in the law. This sounds pretty perverse to them. But what does Jesus mean by it? Tim? About eating them. Eating, right. eating his flesh and drinking his blood. What does right. he mean? That when he gets to the Lord's Supper after his death and communion that we have every Lord's Day, you know, observing the memorial of his, his death, burial, and resurrection by partaking of the. You know, so I would say that. that and, they're, they're closely, they're very tightly connected, but it's because it's not that he's looking forward to the Lord's Supper exactly, it's that he's talking about the same thing that we're acting out when we observe the Lord's Supper, okay? Because this audience, they didn't, they didn't know that that was gonna happen. He just says, eat my flesh and drink my blood. So it's easy for us to associate the two, and we should. That's part of why John writes this down, because he's writing to people who are aware of the Lord's Supper. But this audience, they're not gonna get that. What should they get out of this? When he says, eat my flesh and drink my blood. Logan? That he's the he he is the source to sustain them. The, the, to parallel the manna that came. Yeah. So as we think about that passage in Leviticus 17, where he said, "Don't eat blood because the life is in the blood, and that's what brings about the atonement." That's the point. Take my life into you. Make me a part of you. Make me, let me be what gives you life. And then you, I will raise you up on the last day, right? And then you can have this enduring eternal life. Make me what animates you, what sustains you, what gives you life. That's what he's trying to get to for this audience. And like Tim has pointed out, for a later audience for us, yeah, he's also thinking about what he's going to do with we keep pointing at this table, <laughs> uh, what he's going to be doing with the Lord's Supper, with communion later on. All right. Kayla, can you read verses 60 through 65, please? 
When many of his disciples heard it, they said, This is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, Do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The word that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. Thank you. Number six, when Jesus heard his disciples grumbling, what did he ask them? Yes, this has caused you to stumble. I mean, what I'm telling you is that are you going to? Is you this fall, upsetting fall, to you? Are you, you, are you well, going to right? not believe because of this? Yeah. Okay. He's trying to get them to think spiritually to begin with. Now, he, after he says that, he continues on in verse sixty-two about the Son of Man ascending to where he was before. Is he just shifting gears drastically again? Look, he's talking about the bread coming down from heaven, and it's just a reversal of that. Yeah. It's like, would you be shocked if I went back up? Right. You know? I told you that, that I came down from heaven. Well, now I'm telling you I'm going to go back up. And his point is still that uh, they're searching for life down here. When the life came from up there and is going back up there, they're looking in the wrong place. They're uh, looking in, in fleshly terms. Let's finish it out. Uh, Dan, can you read verses 66 through 71? From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. And Jesus said to the twelve, Do you also want to go away? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, Son of the living God. Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spoke of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for it was he who would betray him being one of the twelve. Thank you. Number seven, after many of his disciples deserted him, what did Jesus ask the twelve? You want to go too? Yeah. Uh -huh. You're going to leave me as well? Number eight, what was Peter's response? You got a better place? <laughs> All right. You have the words of eternal life. And then who did Peter assert that Jesus is? The Christ, right? The Holy One of God. Uh, and did everybody in attendance there agree with him? Not completely. Um, number nine, who was going to betray you? Uh, Jesus. <laughs> Gave up the answer there, didn't I? As if it was a difficult question. Yeah, uh, Judas is there, and he's in Peter's hearing, but not everybody quite agrees. Not everybody quite believes. All right, we've got like a minute left. Let's just spend it on question one under thinking about the lesson. What kind of physical benefits are people today expecting from religion? Now, oh, Easy life. Like okay. no hardships. Yeah, like that's a, yeah. Any, like, hardships. a nice general one. Absolutely. They think that it's going to clear up all their problems in this physical world. Typically doesn't. <laughs> Often it uh, leads to problems in the physical world. What else? Tim? Food again. <laughs> social social friendships. Yeah. Food, shelter kind of goes along with that. You said social aspects of it, so, so friendship. Uh, what else? Power, recognition. Rec yeah, okay, yeah. So status and that sort of thing, yeah. Um, sometimes people are looking for political advocacy. Some people are looking for vengeance on their enemies through their religion, which is kind of disturbing. Sometimes they're looking to be told, you're a special snowflake, and you're better than all the others. Um, these are all problems. These are all the same problem that the ancient Jews were having. They're looking for life in the wrong places. They're looking at it in fleshly terms. They're looking at what Jesus can do for them in the flesh. And he says, the flesh is no help at all. The life comes from the Spirit. All right, thank you. We have Lesson 87 on Sunday.
<laughs> How's it going? You know, brother. I did meet your brother, yeah. Yeah, he said, he said, you know what? Yeah, I don't think it works. Yeah, we visited him Sunday. He actually knows my brother really well. Yeah. Uh, my brother went in. He was at Expressway. He was there, so. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, so he just knew a lot of the same people we knew. Yeah. He's just in FC. Yeah, okay, so he's just walking in FC. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I didn't see you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It is, yeah. Mark, if your songbook for using one, we're going to sing uh, 479, I Bring My Sins to Thee, as an invitation song following Dan's invitation songs uh, this evening. But before we do, we'll sing uh, number 530, I'm Not Ashamed to Own My Lord, and then Dan will offer the uh, invitation. I'm not ashamed to own my Lord, nor to defend his cause. Maintain the honor of his word, the glory of his cross. Firm as his throne, his promise said that he can well Evening, we've got a, I would say, a surprisingly good number here in the building. We have 11 families with us online as well, uh, many of our own, and uh, I would assume a few from uh, perhaps Northwest uh, as well, maybe. But uh, it's good to uh, see all of you here in person, nonetheless. I um, failed to mention it, it's kind of as an aside. I saw Chuck, uh, Chuck and Debbie. Uh, last week when I was in St. Louis on Thursday. So they uh, they send their regards for everybody. They were eager to hear uh, how we've been making out health-wise and, and everything else, get some updates uh, on Dave and on Warren and all that. So they uh, they send their love to us. Um, with that said, I do have a, a few thoughts to share uh, for the invitation tonight before we uh, close out with that final song and prayer. Uh, go ahead and turn in your Bibles to 1 Samuel uh, 17. Uh, again, 1 Samuel 17, while you are uh, turning there, I'll offer a couple of opening thoughts. Um, you know, my uh, kids, the girls in particular, are starting to get older, um, and they're starting in like some very small ways right now um, to kind of take ownership for their faith, right? They're starting, you can tell, to really think through things, and they're making some real-world applications. They're starting to retain lessons. They're old enough now. They've you know, they've heard kind of the basic Bible stories a few times, and so uh, they have at least some like basic recall for like kind of the highlights of what happened, and and they're always like adding to it, you know, as we as we revisit them time and time again, um, and so that's all that's all good, right? That's progress. Um, I have been increasingly observing myself as this happens now. Um, you know, where am I teaching successfully, right? How can I figure out what they kind of need 
um, you know, next as they take those steps and they start to, uh, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, you know, take some more individual ownership for it, really make it their own faith, right? Because ultimately, what I'm trying to foster is is their faith, right? Can't do it for them. Um, not, and I'm not trying to build their faith in me, right? I'm trying to build their faith in someone else, namely in in God, right? And at some point, they have to take it, right? And they have to run with it. And it's going to, you know, hopefully flourish. Um, but, you know, it's, it's going to be theirs to make of it uh, what they will. Um, so obviously, I hope that that's going to happen. Um, so I wonder, you know, a couple of things, you know, how are they going to do that, right? What's it going to look like when they start to really, like, take it and own it and start running with it? And selfishly, how am I going to feel about it? Um, <clears throat> been looking at parents in the Bible lately. Um, you know, so one of them that I've always kind of wondered about is Jesse, right? How did Jesse feel about David? Um, you know, we know from um, 1 Samuel here that Jesse was... He's described as being pretty old um, by the time David is a youth, right? Don't know exactly how old, um, but you know he's not he's not young. David is the youngest of eight. Um, <clears throat> so again, how did uh, how do we think Jesse felt about David, right? The young David, right? The David um, who's taking care of sheep. Uh, he's told to take food to his brothers. Um, again, described as a youth in uh, verse thirty-three there in First Samuel seventeen. Um, how does Jesse feel about David's confrontation with Goliath? Um, David is described as a youth. Goliath uh, charitably is not, right? Uh, the first seven verses here, just as a quick refresher for us. First uh, Samuel 17. Now the Philistines gathered their armies together to battle, and they and were gathered together at Sukkah, which belongs to Judah, and camped between Sukkah and Azekah in Aphis Damon. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together, and they encamped in the valley of Elah and drew up in battle array against the Philistines. The Philistines stood on the mountain on one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side, with a valley between them. And a champion came out from the camp of the Philistines, named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span. He had a bronze helmet on his head, and he was armed in a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was five thousand shekels of bronze. And he had bronze armor on his legs, and a bronze javelin between his shoulders. Now the, st <clears throat> now the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his iron spearhead weighed six hundred shekels. And a shield bearer went before him. Not a small man, not a man who was new to war, as the uh, text will later describe. So again, how specifically do we think Jesse felt about David <clears throat> um, engaging Goliath? Right? Proud of David? Um, I don't know. Maybe. I mean, you know, David's uh, battle with Goliath uh, is pretty clearly a demonstration of David's faith, right? If we look uh, in verses uh, starting in forty-five, we can see just you know from how does how David describes it. Um, David said to the Philistine, "You come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will." Uh, this day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcass, carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. David's going to do all these things, you know, not of his own accord, not for his own glory, but rather you know, he's, he's doing it for God. And he's, he's taking clearly confidence in the fact that he's going to accomplish it. Uh, through God, not because he, you know, David is, uh, uh, that, uh, where was it here? Uh, David is, or that, uh, so if Goliath is six cubits, he, you know, David's not saying I'm seven cubits, right? He's, he's clearly uh, relying on something else. So again, I'm thinking here of Jesse, right? David, uh, the youngest of eight, has demonstrated some real faith, right? He's not just confessing it, right? He's taking a very, like, dramatic, physically risky, life-altering kind of a step based on that faith. So Jesse, you know, what's, uh, what's his reaction here? Uh, maybe proud of David, maybe a little bit alarmed that David took this step. Um, what about his other sons who were there, right? He had three sons also in the army. How does he feel about them now, right? Um, is he maybe disappointed in them for not rising to the challenge that Goliath issued? Um, maybe he's upset with them for allowing David to enter the battle, right? Kind of minimizing David a little bit, you know, like you shouldn't have done that. You know, you were too young or that was, you know, too big of a step for you or whatever else. 
Um, how does he feel about uh, King Saul, right? Saul initially, we didn't read it here, but Saul initially says, you can't, you can't do this. Um, you know, he's, you know, you're, you are a youth. Uh, Goliath has been a warrior since his youth, right? Drawing a clear contrast there. And yet David wears him down and it doesn't take very long, right? And Saul eventually allows for it. So a lot of things there just for me to ponder, right? Jesse isn't discussed a whole lot, so we don't have answers to those questions. But, you know, like for me, it's interesting to kind of look at that and ponder, right? You know, David took a big step. What does Jesse do? Does he... Does he support that? Does he welcome it? Um, does he have some doubts about it himself? Don't know. Don't know, but it's an interesting thing to kind of wonder about. Uh, fortunately, there are some other biblical situations where we do see um, somebody's child act in faith, and then we get to see the reactions uh, of those around them, right? We can make some determinations based on that. Uh, this is an invitation. We're just going to look at one other example. Uh, flip forward um, to uh, John 9. Um, we'll... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, we'll uh, do a little reading out of John 9 as well there. Um, starting in the first verse. Now, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents have sinned, but that uh, this was that the work of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light in the world. When he had said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. Therefore the neighbors and those who previously had seen that he was blind said, Is this not he who sat and begged? Some said, This is he. Others said, This is like him. He said, I am he. Therefore they said to him, How were your eyes opened? He answered and said, A man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and I received sight. And they said to him, Where is he? And he said, I do not know. So far, so good, right? Um, we'll continue the reading here, verse 13. Uh, they brought him who formerly was blind to the Pharisees. Now it was a Sabbath when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. And the Pharisees asked him again how he had received his sight. He said to them, He put clay on my eyes, and I washed, and I see. Therefore some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, because he does not keep the Sabbath. Others said, How can a man who is a sinner do such signs? There was a division among them. Uh, verse 17. They said to the blind man again, what do you say about him because he opened your eyes? He said, he's a prophet. So obviously the Pharisees are having some doubts. Um, there are some technicalities regarding the Sabbath that they are concerned about. Uh, broadly, they're debating, is it possible for this to be done apart from God or could it only have been done through God? You know, um, there's an obvious question here. Should they have known about the blind man? Um, Probably, right, if he's a beggar and he's blind, he would presumably conspicuous, right? Everybody else knew that he was around. Um, but we'll, you know, that's, we'll be charitable, assume they don't recognize him, they don't know his story. Um, so from that perspective, wanting to verify the miracle, right, that this is not some sort of a hoax, that's at least like reasonable on its face, right? Um, so they ask him some more questions starting in 18. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of him who had received his sight. And they asked them, saying, Is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered them and said, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind. But by what means he now sees, we do not know. Or who opened his eyes, we do not know. He is of age. Ask him. He will speak for himself. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had agreed already that if anyone confessed that he was the Christ, he would be put out from the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he is of age, ask him. So now we're running into some trouble here, right? Ask him, he is of age, he will speak for himself. Not because they were genuinely confused, but because they were afraid of those who were asking the questions. Parents are willing to indirectly confirm that a miracle has taken place. Um, but they refuse to acknowledge it directly, right? They're not going to source it. Parents, so, so you know, let's go back to kind of our original premise, right? Parents and children here. The parents see that their son has faith and he has demonstrated it, right? 
And this is not something he was necessarily noteworthy for before, right? But um, he's, he's demonstrated it, and the faith is rewarded, right, in this very meaningful way. You know, he has something that up to this point in his life, he has not had. This is not a secret for any of them. And yet here they are, right, hiding, cowed by these earthly kind of concerns, fear of, uh, fear of being put out of the synagogue. Why was he healed, right? Jesus said so back in verse 3, so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Son recognizes this, right? We're not going to read everything in 24 through 34, right? But he doesn't back down from the Pharisees, right? He uses some very simple and straightforward logic uh, to indicate to them that, you know, clearly this was, this was somehow from God. And they're saying, you know, the Jews have all, you know, the Pharisees have all these problems with it. And yet, I have my sight. Something good has been done here. You guys are refusing to accept it. The example is specifically about a son and his parents, uh, but the broader point is relevant for all of us, right? You know, there's challenges are going to come, right? Some people, like this blind son, they're going to confess their faith knowing that, uh, and they're going to accept the consequences, right? The son was put out um, of the synagogue. Others, they're going to try and sidestep it, avoid choosing sides. We see that with the parents, right? They recognize that something has happened. They're not willing uh, to admit to uh, where they believe it has come from. They're not willing to source it. Um, some are going to outwardly choose the wrong side, right? Like the Pharisees, for whatever reason. What is Jesus looking for in his followers out of all of this? Um, let's... Uh, as we look at the text here, verses uh, 35 and onward, let's let him have the last word with it. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and when he had found him, he said to him, Do you believe in the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, You have both seen him, and it is he who is talking with you. And then he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who may... Who, and those who see may be made blind. That judgment is coming that he has described there. If you're not ready, let's get ready, right? We can all help with that. We can pray with you. We can pray for you. Um, you know, whatever you need uh, to, to make correction, to maybe take of that opportunity for the first time. What we don't want is for that opportunity to be presented in the same way that it was for the son, in the same way that it was for the parents, um, and for us to, to turn away from it, to sidestep it, to wait for another time. Uh, so again, uh, consider these things. Uh, if there's anything that we can be of any sort of assistance with, uh, make those things known, please, please, as we stand and as we sing. I bring my sins to thee, the sins I cannot count, that all may cleanse it be in thy once open fell. I bring them, Savior, all to Thee. The burden is too great for me. The burden is too great for me. I bring my grief to Thee. The grief I cannot tell. No word shall need it be. Thou His invitation is his thoughts there that um, you know, we we all need to um, you know, think about uh, how we can you know impact our children being the example that we should be ultimately it's all up to us 
and at some point in time we let go of the reins and you know our kids hopefully have had that upbringing that um, that we should uh, provide uh, to them and then they will go out on their own one day and and, and uh, hopefully lead the Christian life that they should um, I know we have some some sick amongst I think uh, Harley's got a crew home that's that's sick uh, Janet's not feeling well um, I know we've got um, Dan and I have a, a, a call tomorrow with uh, Hamilton Point about Dave and his rehab and how that's going and what the plan is for him and how he's responded and those kind of things and he'll be involved in that as well so we'll have a, a good interchange I'm, I'm sure of what's, <laughs> what's happening and what maybe is not happening but we'll be able to report back to you but uh, I think you know uh, physically he's he's starting to you know come around and I think those are some good kind of things that we'll be able to to hear and continue to pray about um, I also heard from from Tina that Warren they're looking at Warren to go to a facility kind of over across uh, frame on a work trail there uh, there's a facility over there but they haven't been given approval uh, to move over there yet but it's a rehab that we're warm will be uh, over there so we'll continue to pray for that uh, let's continue to pray for Devin I know he's going to be going to to Vanderbilt if he's not already there yeah I actually had an update on that he went yesterday and went to the colleges he had some tests uh, actually really positive results the tumors have shrank by 50 percent the spot in his lungs was gone completely. Uh, so the doctor is pretty encouraged by that. And he yeah, meets with the surgeons tomorrow to discuss removing the remaining spot. Okay, great. So some good news there. So continue to, to pray for him that things will continue to go well. And uh, we uh, want to make sure that we pray for each other, you know, for going not just going home tonight, but, you know, for the next couple of days. Uh, you know, the ice is probably a lot worse than the snow. We've all lived through a lot of that around here if we lived here long enough. We know that you can be without power and you can be without, without heat. So just let each other know after you've charged your cell phones fully tonight <laughs> to uh, to know if you run out of power that maybe somebody not so far away has uh, a warmer house than maybe you have because you don't want to have to live in a house that doesn't have any heat for a couple of days. Uh, but let's just keep each other in mind, you know, the next couple of days. Be safe uh, going home and just uh, continue to pray for each other. Uh, are there any other announcements we need to make before we're dismissed? Okay, if not, Steve, will you lead us in a word of prayer? Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you now, Lord, and we just thank you for the opportunity to come together and encourage each other to open up your word and study from it and apply it to our lives that we can bring others to you, Lord. Father, we, we thank you so much for all you've blessed us with. We thank you for our, our jobs and our warm houses right now, Lord. We thank you for all our many other physical blessings. Father, we specifically thank you for your church, for sending your son here to die on the cross for us for your, your spiritual blessings as well, Lord. Father, we ask that you be with the members who aren't here with us tonight. We ask that you be with them. And we know we have uh, many of sick. Be with uh, Dave, be with Devin. Father, be with Sheila, be with all the many sick members we have here and be with those taking care of them and, and continue to heal them if it be your will, Lord. Father, we ask that you keep us safe throughout this upcoming weather and this upcoming week, Lord, Father, we ask that you continue to bless us and, and forgive us of our sins when we repent of them, Lord. And in your son's name we pray. Amen.